It really has been an interesting couple of weeks. Um, we got evacuated on August 4th and uh, that was quite the experience. In fact, that's what this episode is about. It's about me telling you my experiences with being evacuated. But um, we are back home now, as you can see, but uh, the, the whole situation's not over yet. In fact, right where I'm standing, this is what it looked like yesterday. All right, so this is pretty crazy. The smoke overhead here. And this isn't color corrected. This is just this is just how red it is. This is wild. So as you can see, it's definitely not over, but uh, you know, the the firefighters and the emergency uh, team are doing everything they can and um I've been shown some incredible things over this past two weeks, and that's exactly what this episode is about. It's called The Kindness. If you watch it all the way through to the end, you'll understand why I titled it that, and you'll also see why throughout this entire situation, I feel incredibly blessed, lucky, and grateful. Do you know what they call a gathering of ravens? An unkindness. Over this past week and several days, and despite a foreboding ominous beast that lurks menacingly from the trees overlooking town, I have experienced anything but an unkindness. There's a lot to cover here. Many days of significance and meaning. But I'll start with the one most easily discussed. The fire. Somewhere along the rolling pines that surround our rural oasis, there trundles a vengeful monster. This is not a cautionary tale to keep kids from the woods. No, this is very real. Some 55,650 hectares have been consumed by this ravenous demon of flame. And with each blink, each breath, it seems to tessellate ever closer. So close, in fact that the call came down from those that keep watch over this marigold monster, that we were to evacuate immediately. It was well into the evening when the call came in. Our hearts quickened, and our movements became frantic and expeditious. We'd been on alert for potential evacuation for some time prior, but when that call comes in, when there's that knock on the door and nictating emergency lights breaking in through your windows, Reality in all of its most brutal forms takes hold. We packed what we could and began to drive away. That is a powerfully unique circumstance to find yourself within. Driving away from sanctuary, toward the unknown with no idea if you'll ever see it again. We found ourselves sewn to a winding convoy that navigated the darkened roads away from town. I suspect that we were all connected by shared feelings of incredulity and dismay. Sheena, the kids, a dog and two cats, as well as myself, would settle into a modest hotel for a few hours of respite before having to confront the realities of the next morning. This is when things began to weigh on me. Subjective woes. For many years of my life, I ran toward emergency. As a paramedic, my job was to bring calm and order to chaos and disarray. But now, on the day after evacuating our family home, I was left feeling rudderless and adrift. No clear idea what to do. A useless rescuer, banished to be another face among the crowd of those in need. This was a frightfully piteous contemplation to gnaw upon, but this is and was my reality. So when we walked through the prodigious doors of another hotel lobby that had been made into an evacuee sign-in center, I did so with head drooping low. But in the midst of my self-loathing, something wonderfully juxtaposing raised my gaze. 
As my eyes took inventory of my surroundings, one profound detail began to emerge. Each and every person that donned a blue vest marked helper was also accented by another moniker, volunteer. Each and every person that placed a supportive hand on our shoulders, handed us clean, cool water to drink, was a person giving up their time and subjective comforts to ensure that we had somewhere to go, food to eat, and a few uninterrupted moments of peace. I didn't begin to feel more useful nor worthy, but I did start to inflate with gratitude, humbled by my surroundings. Such sincere faces, their expressions all conveyed empathy in its truest form. And that gave birth to hope. And hope is a powerful vanquisher of self-pity. The accommodations that were to be our home for the foreseeable future was iconically seated within the one and only Salmon Arm. To some, that might not sound like anything. In fact, some of you may be even thinking through crinkled brow, but salmons don't have arms. And you'd be right to do so. It's a unique name and an arguably even more unique place. It's also a place that I call home for many years. My formative years, actually. And it has remained a symbol of comfort and stability for me along this sometimes punitive road of life. Salmon Arm is not all wonderment to me, though. Much like many other things in our lives, it is a place of layered complexity and experience. It's where I had my first kiss, got into my first fight, learned to do burnouts in a local parking lot, drank my first beer, found out that I love whiskey, and a place that introduced me to my very best friend in this world through to this day. It's also where I lived when my father was taken away by the police, where my mom fell ill and would try to take her own life, only to live and battle cancer. Like I said, it's a complex place, but for a while, it was home. The hotel we were gifted was nestled along the hill next to the hospital, a place I spent many an hour as a boy. Much of my homework, what little of it I did, was done in a hospital room whilst sat in an uncomfortable plastic facsimile of a chair. My mother would rest, tubes and wires laying atop of her weary body. That scenery made the concept of doing homework seem less and less important. One evening, some days into being evacuated, I excused myself to go for a walk. I traipsed along a pristine pathway that hugged the contours of a small, decorative lake. A lake that I had also spent a lot of time with as a boy, as it rested near the hospital. Many emotions flooded my thinking space. Some fond, some not so. The reason I am no longer a paramedic is because I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And with that diagnosis, my symptoms manifest as near nightly terrors that cause me to wake forcefully and suddenly. Sometimes I even fall from bed. A rude awakening, to say the least. But when secured by the comforts of our home back in Falkland, the familiarity of my surroundings helps guide me back to the present, as does my girlfriend, Sheena. So when I am uprooted and placed into, let's say, a hotel, Waking from a nightmare and seeing nothing of usual visual comfort causes quite the fright within me. You see, these nightmares don't simply feel like bad dreams. They feel like time travel. Like I'm right back in those terrible moments amidst the bad things. Smells, tastes, and touch all come back as if they were happening again. After returning from my emotionally charged walkabout, I entered in through the hotel lobby. A soft mezzo queried as to how I was doing. It came from one of the staff behind the counter. A young woman. I began to speak, but she interrupted me politely. You look tired. Are you one of the evacuees? I nodded in acknowledgement. Her features, hidden mostly behind a protective mask, began to melt into agonizing empathy, visible to the naked eye. She assured me that everything would be alright. She said that she believed I'd get to go home soon. I smiled and said, I hope so, and then went upstairs. 
Her kindness helped lift the burden of sadness that I had been carrying in through the parting glass doors. She didn't need to be kind. She didn't need to say anything. So I appreciated her words. During my stay at the hotel, I made acquaintances with numerous other evacuees, all from Falkland. And the one thing these encounters had in common was that even though they too had been displaced and uprooted from their own lives, they made sure to ask how I was doing. Each and every person I spoke to placed others in front of themselves in order of importance. During a solo ride of the elevator on one arbitrary trip up and down, I found myself smiling, beaming with a pride at this little place in the valley. Falkland, my new home. It too is a place of layered textures and people. But from what I observed when hastily removed from our humble slice of the Canadian pie, the people of Falkland are as rare a breed as they come. Kind, hardworking, no-nonsense people. And that too helped alleviate the burden of sadness within me. Because what I mourn for no longer being a paramedic, I gain in having the ability to say, I am from Falkland. And that makes me Falkland Strong. And so, to each and every one of you that passed me in the hallways, on the elevators, or along the aisles of the grocery store, thank you. You may have had no idea the personal hell I was experiencing, but your smiles, taps on the back, and wishes goodnight made all the difference in the world. Falkland. I love it here. Home. A gathering. Of kindness. It's nothing new, but it's so good to see you. We do this every day, and I'm still so amazed by you. So hold me tight through the i